The Boss DS-1 is an absolute classic distortion pedal. Released in 1978, this was the first distortion in Boss's original lineup. It's gone through a few component changes over the years as certain critical parts have become unobtainium. This modern production unit opts for SMD rather than the traditional through-hole components, much to the disappointment of the modding community, but in terms of tone, none of that matters because it's not the components but the circuit that makes the sound. Join me as we gain appreciation for Bossy's best-selling effects pedal. Let's get an overview of the DS1 circuit topology to understand what we are dealing with. Predictably, we'll start with an input buffer. Nothing surprising there. This is followed by a transistor boost stage placed ahead of the op-amp and clipping stage, which is the core of any distortion pedal. Of course, a tone stack and level control come after the gain staging, and finally we close out the signal path with an output buffer. Inside the DS1, we'll also see components relating to the power distribution and the GIFET bypass switching, but I won't be focusing on those elements in this video as they're common to all boss pedals. Right now, we're only going to focus on the DS1's signal path, which can look quite daunting when presented as one large circuit like this, so let's split it up into the five blocks mentioned previously. Here's a closer look at the input buffer. The job of any buffer is to change the signal impedance while retaining unity gain. Unity gain simply means that the output from this transistor will be at the same level as its input. The buffer does not increase the signal amplitude. It's not amplifying in that sense. It's simply there to act as a junction between the high impedance pickup signal and the low impedance pedal circuit, cushioning the collision so not to incur tonal losses. If you pay attention going forward, you'll notice capacitors like this one at the start of each section of the circuit. These are DC blocking capacitors. Our audio signal is AC and can pass right through these capacitors without issue, but any DC voltage that happens to be hitching a ride on the signal will be stopped by the blocking capacitor. This is perfect for removing bias voltages that we may want to add to make our pedal work. This boost stage has possibly the biggest impact over the final sonic performance of the DS1. It comprises of some basic EQ filtering leading into a single transistor amplifier. This is not dissimilar to the circuit of a Rangemaster style treble booster and is performing a similar function inside the DS1, attenuating low frequencies before massively increasing the signal level. The low frequency attenuation in this case is not as severe as what we'd see inside of a treble booster. It's really only cutting low frequencies 33 Hz and below, right at the bottom of our audible range, well below any notes that the guitar is playing. But that's the kind of low frequency noise we don't want to get amplified and distorted as it would just muddy up the notes we do want to hear. It's best to prune out this unwanted low end early before it becomes a problem. The voltage gain of the transistor is set by these two resistors and then refined by the contents of the feedback network. Feedback networks in amplifiers are incredibly important. They essentially reduce the overall gain of the amplifier to provide essential stability, keeping the amplifier from running away into oscillations, reducing the potential for noise and generally making the amplifier behave more consistently. Despite the negative feedback, there is still a massive amount of gain applied by the transistor, which will push the signal amplitude above the 9 volt supply limit, clipping the signal in an asymmetric way. This means the signal is already distorting before it even reaches the main op-amp stage of the pedal. No matter what happens next, this transistor boost stage is going to be exerting a considerable amount of influence. Moving on, we are met with an op-amp gain stage, which isn't all that different from the gain stages in any op-amp based distortion effect. Here we have twin op-amps performing amplification, with the gain of the amplifier being set by the distortion control in the feedback network. This is then followed with a pair of diodes connected to AC ground, which will clip both halves of the waveform into hard distortion. We see this positive 4.5 volt AC ground being set up right after our DC blocking capacitor, biasing the input of the op amp to the middle of the voltage range. This diode connected to ground is there to protect the op amp from any rising signal voltage that may cause damage or produce undesirable behaviour. Then we have two op amp stages, one feeding directly into the other. These are set up to be non-inverting amplifiers, increasing the signal level. 
The feedback network of the second op amp contains the gain control, labelled as dist on the pedal. Varying the resistance of this potentiometer will affect how much of the signal gets sent back through the feedback network, controlling how much amplification the op amp provides. While this capacitor here ensures that high frequencies are always bypassing the gain control, reducing the overall high frequency overtones at the output of the amplifier, taming the high end fizz that's often associated with distortion. Beyond that, we find a pair of hard clipping diodes connected to AC ground. These will conduct away any signal above 0.7 volts on either half of the waveform, squaring up the distortion response further. This capacitor to ground acts in conjunction with the resistor over here to bleed off some high frequency overtones generated by the clipping. Having the clipping diode sandwiched inside this filter ties the filter's attenuation to how hard the diodes are conducting. I know you're here to learn things, and if you're sick of wading through the mire of mindless memes or the river of ridiculous react videos here on YouTube, then today's sponsor Skillshare might be exactly what you're looking for. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives, with thousands of classes led by industry professionals across the disciplines of film, illustration, design, productivity and more. There are literally thousands of classes to choose from, but if option paralysis is a problem and you just can't decide which of Skillshare's myriad classes will set you on the right road, then you can pick a learning path, a curated sequence of classes which are designed to help you reach a desired educational outcome. I've been following Cooking for Beginners, which brings together four different classes to help me learn essential kitchen skills, how to craft my own sauces, and turn out plates of Italian classics. Each of the curated classes brings together a different aspect of the culinary discipline and saves me time searching for the right classes to watch. The first 500 viewers to click the link in the description of this video will receive one month free trial of Skillshare, which is plenty of time to pick up some tips and tricks on how to improve your life. So if you want to learn something new and have your path laid out in front of you, then why not try Skillshare today? Next we arrive at the tone stack where we will find controls for both level and tone. The tone control is attached to a network of resistors and capacitors which form two filters. I've covered this double filter tone control before in my video all about how different tone circuits are implemented in drive pedals. The DS1 has pretty much the same filter arrangement as the Big Muff, where the potentiometer blends between two different filters. One that attenuates high end and the other which attenuates low end, leaving a slight mid scoop in the knob's 12 o'clock position where the two filters meet. This is a very simple way to get a wide range of adjustability over the global EQ balance. Finally, we arrive at the output buffer, which also converts impedance while maintaining unity gain. That's the DS1 circuit in a nutshell, and it would be a fairly unremarkable distortion circuit were it not for that transistor boost stage early in the chain. If we consider the MXR Distortion Plus or the Procorat to be trying to emulate amplifier distortion, then we can think of the DS1 as emulating a distorted amp with a boost pedal out front. It's quite unapologetic about being a distortion pedal. It doesn't want to clean up and do those low gain drive sounds. It wants to be a boosted, filthy rock box. We can see on the oscilloscope that the signal is still hard clipping even at minimum gain, so we have plenty of range on that gain control to square up the distortion further. And that twin filter tone control gives us enough flexibility to adjust for bright or dark sounding amps and guitars. With its ease of use, accessibility and for the time unparalleled saturation in a compact pedal, this made for an excellent lead or solo distortion which might go some way to explaining why artists like Joe Satriani and Steve Vai made extensive use of this orange dirt box in their early careers. But for me, the sound of the DS1 is pure nirvana, and by that I obviously mean Kurt Cobain. Whenever I step on this pedal, it always smells like teen spirit.
I'm going to leave you with some isolated guitar sounds. But if you do want to grab a DS1 for yourself, then you will find product links in the description of this video. If there are any more distortion pedals you'd like to see given the gain appreciation treatment, then why don't you leave a comment telling me all about it. Keep it loud, and let's hear the DS1 in action. Mm -hmm.